It's posted on, yes, so yesterday's lecture is on um, the homework assignment from yesterday. So I'm just going to post the link with the homework. It's just 6.2, just 6.2, not 6.3. Okay, so we started off with section 6.2 talking about Charles Darwin, okay? British naturalist, studied plants and animals, went on a voyage, the ship's name was Beagle, it went around the world, he made observations, collected specimens of plants and animals, um, brought it back to England to be studied, and uh, you know, realized, hey, you know, all of these birds, they're very similar, but they're different, you know, what's going on here. Discovered that there was a relationship between the islands of the Galapagos Islands, the islands, wow, the, the food sources on the Galapagos Islands and the features um, that those organisms had in order to feed on it, which brings us to natural selection, where an adaptation or a variation gives an organism benefit to compete for food, they survive, they go on and reproduce. And so I'm just going to talk about what adaptations are. So adaptations cover, like, um, they're found in every single individual of that species. Okay, so I'm just going to go right away, you know, to jackrabbits. They have big ears for a reason. Big ears, blood vessels can travel in the ears and release body heat so they can stay cooler during hot temperatures. So all jackrabbits have big ears. All jackrabbits have very powerful hind legs that allow them to move very adequately in their environments. So adaptations, like, it's found in all the individuals. Variations, only a few of them have it. Okay. So there are three types of adaptations. Structural, behavioral, and functional. Structural, you're looking at color, size, shape, other physical features. So like the tortoise neck length, that would be a structural adaptation. The beak of a finch, structural adaptation. Behavioral adaptations, how it acts. So we have some organisms that are nocturnal. They're active at night. They stay out of the, the heat of the day. Okay, so like snakes. Well, because these isn't, aren't they rodents? Rodents are nocturnal creatures. Um, hunting at night. Mm -hmm. Jordan, did you want to share something? Um, do you have to record this in Madison? Yeah, I do. Hi, Madison. <laughs> Are you recording right now? <laughs> okay, so we have behavioral adaptations. Functional adaptations, this one can be kind of cool and trippy, but you actually change your internal body system or biochemistry. So jackrabbits, like I said, they have these big ears, but inside the big ears, they have these blood vessels that it can expand. So more blood will rush to their ears and release that body heat. Yeah. There are um, functional adaptations for birds that live in cold environments. So you know, like, you know, here's the Arctic, right? And the temperature could be like below freezing, okay? But they're like swimming. Okay, that's really bad. But they're like bird. bird, some type of waterfowl. Okay, be quiet. I was trying to draw a duck and it didn't turn out that way. <laughs> yes, the jackrabbit in the Arctic. Um, where the blood doesn't like go to their feet. So it like just like, oh, it's cold water. We don't want to lose body heat. Let's just not travel through the legs. And then they just go elsewhere. Okay. So they just don't go to the feet. It's kind of cool, I think. But whatever. If you think that's cool, and you just wait for my example of wallabies, okay? We take a trip to the Australian outback and talk about wallabies. I'm going to skip that. Here we go. So here's my example of the Australian wallaby. Redneck wallaby. Let's look at this one. Redneck wallabies keep cool by licking their paws and wrists. This uses much less water than sweating. Do you think that is structural, behavioral, or functional? Functional. Behavioral. behavioral. Licking the wrist all the time. Okay, so that is behavioral. Yeah, nice job. Nice job. Okay, let's move on. That's not the cool one. Moving on. Wallabies have the ability to store elastic potential energy in their tendons. 
within their hind legs, allowing them to propel themselves with little effort. Structural, behavioral, or functional? Why do you say structure? Why do you say functional? I'm just curious. Is it talking about behavior? Then it's not behavioral. That's not behavioral, though. Oh, for functional? Functional is internal biochemistry. So it's structural. It's structural because we are talking about what? The way they jump. Specifically, what do they use to jump? Their legs. These elastic potential tendons in their hind legs. We're talking about a structure here. So this one is structural. All right. Up here. Red-necked wallaby. Oh, yeah, that's a type of wallabies. Maybe not. I don't know. Has a natural born instinct to flee at the first sign of danger. Structural, functional, or behavioral? Behavioral. Man, any sign of danger, like, I'm out. Getting out of here. Okay, they're just... All right, here's the cool one. Here's the tricky one. Mother wallabies have the ability to temporarily freeze the development of an embryo during pregnancy. So what do we mean by freeze? No, it doesn't get frozen in carbonite. It just means pause. So they pause the development of the embryo during pregnancy if the conditions are not right. So is that structural, functional, or behavioral? That is functional. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, oops, I thought I clicked on behavioral. Okay. Yeah, so this is functional. Um, I mean, like, how cool is that? You can just pause the development of your child because conditions are not right. Like, you know, I'm thinking about last year during the pandemic. Nope, nope, don't want a baby during a pandemic. You know, can't find diapers, right? Because everything was, like, cleaned off. But really, I can't imagine if humans could pause. Like, just, well, I'm just going to stop. And you have to be I like, don't have this right now. yeah, and you just this big belly, you know. <laughs> oh, when's it coming? <laughs> I paused it. <laughs> I'll decide that soon, you know. <laughs> we're not sure we're ready yet. We're just yeah. going to wait. We're just going to wait. <laughs> diapers are unstuck. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Moving on. The last one here. The muscular tail of the wallaby serves as a steady and rudder when leaping and can function as a third leg when the wallaby is resting. Structural, functional, or behavioral? Structural, we are talking about their tail, okay? All right, do we feel a little bit better classifying adaptations? Because this is kind of what you're gonna be doing for your project tomorrow, so. Yeah, can we do a party? No. Okay. So moving on to interactions in the environment. So the environment can cause species to evolve or change over time, um, camouflage, okay? Species blend in with their environment so they don't get picked off by some predator. So these two panels right here are showing camouflage. I mean, it's like some type of lizard chameleon and this is some type of bug. Looks like a leaf. Another example of environmental interactions is called mimicry. It is the resemblance of one species to another species. We do have some mimicry in Minnesota, specifically with the monarch butterflies and the viceroy. So I'm just going to wait a little bit so everyone gets the notes so I can zoom in on this picture. Why would you guess? Wasn't in school today? Yep. No, he wasn't. Was he there? Had a Zoom. He had a Zoom. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. 
Ever, I am gonna. Oh. I'll go sit. I'll go sit in the locker room. He told us that. We don't have a right. Well, but yeah, he, he said screamed at Lucas, and he's like, "You have no right." Okay. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just. We're just gonna zoom in on this monarch butterfly and the viceroy <laughs> butterfly here. Look okay. at butterfly. Yeah, look at those They're butterflies. They're so pretty. So pretty. Okay. Well, so the one on the left hand side here is the actual monarch. And the one on the right hand side is the imposter. Kinda sus. Okay. This is the viceroy. So you can see some clear, distinct um, differences. So like on the monarch, obviously size. Monarch butterflies are larger than viscerais. Um, viscerais also have a lot more veins, like venation going on, these black lines. And then a, a third one, and I think that's kind of the one that really tips it off. The monarch, if you look at the tips, you can kind of see it like blends. We have this like dark orange with the light orange back to dark orange. And here it's like, it doesn't blend. Does that make sense? Like when I look at this, I think like watercolors. I don't know why, but that's just where my brain goes. And I look over here, I think like straight up marker, like one color, no blending of shades. Wait, so what's the one on the this one? That's the imposter. This is the viceroy butterfly. And this is the monarch butterfly. Okay. Another example of mimicry has to deal with snakes. Ew. Gross. So over here we have a coral <laughs> snake that's poisonous, dangerous to me. Oh, oh you know what? I gotta go back to the butterflies. Sorry. Let's go back to the butterflies. Why would the viceroy copy the monarch butterfly? Because it wants them to like think that it's a part of their breed. Okay, so it wants to fool something that it's a monarch butterfly. Does anyone know? Like, I don't know, what do you know about monarch butterflies? Just curious if you know anything. It's okay if you don't. There's a bunch of them they that hang out in the trees. Well, somebody told me that they're poisonous. They are, they're actually toxic. Yeah. So if a bird were to pick off a monarch butterfly and eat it, it would throw up. If you take Biology 10 with me or uh, College Biology, I actually show you video slash, like, um, I can't think of the word screen by frame by frame of this bird just like throwing up because it like ate it it's like mm, this is so good and it's like woo, woo, and it throws up so then the bird's like oh my gosh i'm never gonna eat an orange butterfly ever again okay so they're like toxic they make animals sick so the viceroy is like hey that's great protection okay i don't want to get picked up by some bird so i'm gonna try to mimic this more dangerous organism, what if, what even though they're not toxic. What if they did get eaten? Then they would just get eaten. Yeah, and then that bird doesn't learn its lesson, and the next time it picks off an orange butterfly, it may be a monarch. Okay. So they mimic other organisms for some type of added protection. Julia. How are they mimicked? Aren't they just like born that way? Born? I'm so glad you asked that question. It has something to do with, like, just. These two obviously live in the same area. Um, they're orange in color because of like, or they're toxic because of the milkweed. But you know what? That's like the chicken and the egg color. Honestly, I don't, I don't even know how to answer that. It, that's a, like a question that is answered in a college biology class. But it's like through millions of years of evolution because insects have been around for millions of years. So it kind of reminds me of the orchids. Why do some look like monkeys? Why do some look like skulls? Like millions of years of evolution. Okay, so going back to the snake. So here we have a poisonous coral snake, and over here we have a scarlet king snake that is non-poisonous. And so you can see it's trying to mimic the colors of the coral snake, but it's not exact. They're not. It's not perfect. Okay. There's a saying that goes something like. Yes, red touches yellow, kill a fellow. Red touches black, safe for Jack. So here, red touches black, doesn't touch yellow, so red touches black, safe for Jack, this is not poisonous. Over here, red touches yellow, kill a fellow, so he's dangerous. Imposter. <laughs> oh. What's that over 
for them. Let's try this. Do you have a zoom for your shine? Wait, so does the scarlet piece make it to choose if it looks like it? Does the car scarlet? Again, um, I think it just is millions of years. It kind of goes back to Julia's question. Why is the viscerae trying, you know, like how did that even occur? Okay. So living and non-living parts of the environment are always changing. And if a species cannot adapt to their environment, um, they might become extinct. So can anyone think of some organisms that are struggling right now in their environment because it's going through rapid changes and they're not adapting fast enough? Polar bears. Polar bears. That's the big one, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. Any others? No. Monkeys. I was going to say, there is a thing about monkeys. I don't know if that's true. What? Are they? Really? Are they? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Monkeys? Yeah. Oh, tigers, I think. Tigers are. That's just yeah. Oh, I don't know. Oh. I was thinking kangaroos. You are kangaroos. Are they, have like, they have the wildfires, and it did wipe out a big chunk of their population, yes. Are kangaroos extinct? Okay, so we're going to go back to Darwin here for the next couple slides. Um, so Darwin came up with natural selection, right? How an organism has a variation, it gives them an advantage over other individuals. It's heritable, they might cast it onto their offspring, um, and then eventually it might turn into an adaptation. Darwin thought of this idea because he, as a hobby, kept pigeons, and he bred pigeons. And he bred pigeons to have these weird interesting traits like from a common pigeon you know just outside of like we can do on elevator he took that pigeon and another pigeon and you like bred them um, and then he selected for certain traits like oh that's got one that, that one has a really long tail so i'm going to separate that one out oh there's another pigeon that has a really long tail than others and then i have those breed oh that tail is going to be a little bit longer and then i have you know another pigeon with a long tail and i breed and eventually over time you have this pigeon with this beautiful fan tail feather Okay, or like if I zoom in on these pigeons here, the feathers here are curly. I don't know why you'd have a curly feathered pigeon, but whatever. Or like this guy right here, big chested pigeon. I don't know what it's called, but whatever. So you can like breed um, pigeons and they all come from the same species. Right here. Okay, I'm gonna slide over here, wild mustard. If you select for certain traits in wild mustard, you can produce cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, kale, kohlrabi. How do you do that? You take wild mustard, and if you were to um, suppress the flower development, you get broccoli. Or if you make the flowers sterile, so there's no reproductive parts, no stamen, no pistil, it turns into cauliflower. Wait, are, is it yellow mustard in Minnesota, right? What? Yellow mustard is in Minnesota. Yep. Yeah. Hmm, sure, yeah. Cabbage. You suppress the internode length, which means the the distance between one leaf to another on a on a branch or on a flower. Well if you suppress it so it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, then you get a bunch of leaves all folded together, and that's cabbage. So all of these species come from wild mustard. We've talked about corn how humans have directed the evolution of corn. This is what corn used to look like down here. This is what corn looks like today. And it's because of humans selecting for traits. We do this with thoroughbred racing horses in derbies. You know, we breed a fast horse with another fast horse. Mm -hmm. We do this with dogs, with purebreds. Okay, so we can select for traits. Have you ever been to a horse race? Nope. I have. They're, they're, they're kind of boring. All right, so when Darwin returned back to England from his voyage, you know, he did some hobbies, he kept pigeons, but he noticed that breeders used selective breeding. So they only wanted certain traits in organisms and they bred it and they got that trait. So Darwin's like, hmm, could nature do the same thing? Could nature select for certain traits in an organism? And that's how he came up with natural selection. So natural selection means nature causes the changes in species. In selective breeding, humans cause the changes in species. And when humans continue to do selective breeding, it turns into artificial selection. So selective breeding can turn into artificial selection. And so with artificial selection, it kind of explains and supports Darwin's theory of evolution um, because we can do it and nature can do it too.
you write down are scientific and then if I notice huge huge gaps um, so you won't then see I dock points so you won't see this picture. yeah I'll see that when I scan and that will definitely stick out because it's color <laughs> so we should use black. I don't know what you mean by that but you can use whatever color you that helps you so. mm -hmm. all right so we are done with notes for today and the rest of the week. We're not taking any more notes. Now we're going to read out of the book. And we are on page 199. 199. Oh, please work. Can I read real quick and then go through the bathroom? All right, Charles Darwin. How many species of birds can you name? You might think of robins, penguins, or even chickens. Scientists estimate that about 10,000 species of birds live on Earth today. Each bird species has similar characteristics. Each has wings, feathers, and a beak. Scientists hypothesize that all birds evolved from an earlier or ancestral population of bird-like organisms. As this population evolved into different species, birds became different sizes and colors. They developed different songs and even habits, but all retained similar bird characteristics, which means wings, feathers, beak. Next paragraph. Favorite, I think we'll do soup. I think that's where we're at, right? Favorite soup? Yeah. Okay. Favorite soup? Chicken noodle. Classic. I think there's going to be a lot of classic. Julia? It is not Julia. Julia? Not Ellie. Edith, Edith. Nope, nope. Hey. No. Hey. No. Hey. I don't think it's been said. Jared? Jared. Did I actually name it? <laughs> it says chicken noodle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How do birds and other species evolve? Evolve? What scientist who were to answer this question is Charles Darwin. Darwin was an um, English seminarist who is a who in the mid 1800s developed the theory of how evolution works. A nationalist is a person who studies plants and animals by observing them. Darwin spent years observing plants and animals in their natural habitats. Before developing his theory, he called that a theory in the explanation of the nat natural world is well supported by evidence. But Darwin was not the first to develop the theory of evolution. It was theory is the one that's supported by evidence today. <laughs> Voyage of the Beagle. Voyage of the Beagle. Darwin served as a naturalist on the HMS Beagle, a survey ship of the British Navy. During his voyage around the world, Darwin observed and collected many plants and animals. Darwin was especially interested in the organisms he saw on the Galapagos Islands. The islands, shown in Figure 6, are located 1,000 kilometers off the South American coast in the Pacific Ocean. Darwin saw that each island had a slightly different environment. Some were dry, some were more humid, others had mixed environments. Okay. Tortoises. They don't like soup. Who no. doesn't like soup? No. No. Julia. No. Jade. It's Jade. 
So note to self for Jay to say, don't go to our house and bring your soup. She'll just go right back in your face. She'll just kill you. Huh? Mockingbirds and finches. Darwin also became curious about the variety of mockingbirds and finches he saw and collected on the islands. Like the tortoises, different types of mockingbirds and finches lived in different island environments. Later, he was surprised to learn that many of these varieties were different enough to be separate species. Darwin's theory. And what cereal soup? This person has down tomato soup. Oh, yeah. Ellie. No, no. No, no. 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 Madison. It's Madison. So, Hannah, who gets to read? No, no, who gets to read? You get to choose. Because Madison's not here. Um, Peyton. Peyton. <laughs> Darwin or my books. Darwin realized that there was a relationship between each species and the food source of the islands it lived on. Look again at Figure Six. You can see that the, you can see that tortoises with long necks lived on islands that had tall cacti. Their long necks enabled them to reach high to eat the cacti. The tortoises with short necks lived on islands that had plenty of short grass. Thank you. Common ancestors. Darwin became convinced that all the tortoise species were related. He thought they all shared a common ancestor. He suspected that a storm had carried a small ancestral tortoise population to one of the islands from South America millions of years before. Eventually, the tortoises spread to the other islands. Their neck lengths and shell shapes changed to match their island's food sources. How did this happen? Next paragraph. Cheddar broccoli. Darren. No. So variations, you know, a few organisms may have its adaptations, the entire species has it. Natural selection. Oh. All right. Darwin did not know about genes, but he realized that variations were the key to the puzzle of how populations of tortoises and other organisms evolved. Darwin understood that food is a limited resource, which means that the food in each island environment could not support every tortoise that was born. Tortoises had to compete with each other for food. As tortoises spread to the various islands, some are born with random variations in neck length. If a variation benefited a tortoise, allowed it to compete for food better than other tortoises, that tortoise lived longer. Because it lived longer, it reproduced more. It passed on its variation to its offspring. In the final paragraph that we will read today, they have down with tomato soup. No. 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 It is Tayton. What? It says tomato soup. Soup as S U P E soup. Yes, so you can't spell soup. <laughs> tomato soup. 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 Want some soup? Want some soup? Okay, today we're having soap. soap for soup. 
want some soap? This is Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. Natural selection is the process by which populations of organisms with variations that help them survive in the environments live longer, compete better, and reproduce more than those that do not have the same variations. Natural selection explains how populations change as their environments change. It explains the process by which whatever that is, torches become matched to their food sources. As illustrated in figure eight, it also explains the diversity of the Galapagos finches and mockingbirds. <laughs> Birds with beak variations that help them compete for food live long. That says compete, right? Yep, compete. For food, live longer, and reproduce. All right. I so know how to read. We will finish reading um, oh, six point two tomorrow because it's a little bit longer. Oh, we have a worksheet. Yes, you have a worksheet. It is posted in Google Classroom. It is matching a vocab terms mostly. This so is long. It's matching a vocab terms. Uh, no, we will just have to find out tomorrow when we read. Yep. So the assignment. Yes. Um, on the little note cards, how many more things do we have to make new ones? Um, I think we have like three or four. We're getting towards the end because we reuse them a lot. So, all right, here's a, the assignment. Match in a vocab terms. Each term is used once. And then down here, you tell me whether or not it's variation or adaptation. Remember, variations occur in just a few species or a few individuals. Adaptations, the entire species has it. What page is it? Uh, page 199 would be a good place to start. <laughs>